I, you know, I'm, I'm going to confess, um, today's been a great day. Um, I love, really love how Dennis uh, spoke this morning and challenged us uh, to grow, not just, not just in our faith and our actions, but in our understanding of the Word of God and how he challenged um, us all to open up the Word of God and consider reading through the New Testament in uh, a month's time. Every year I get older, profound, and I open up the word of God and it speaks to me anew. Every time I open it up and you'd think you get to the spot where you go, I've seen it, I've read it, I'm moving on, but it never ceases to move me as I just spend time in the word of God reading. It's a powerful admonition, and uh, Dennis, thank you for giving that to us. I hope, I hope that we're up to the task, and I hope that we are in God's word. And it's also hard uh, to get up here and uh, and uh, preach uh, a sermon because we just sang one. Um, and uh, and the song "In Christ Alone" is is maybe. Um, most complete sermon anybody could ever preach. The best confession about Jesus Christ as the author and perfecter of our faith. <laughs> You're all looking, yeah, right. We can't get off that easily. <laughs> I have a, I am captivated uh, by Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 about the story of the garden. Um, there is something about the story of, of the Garden of Eden that really captures my attention and my interest. Because um, there is, you know, God creates the world and it's so idyllic. Idyllic? Idyllic. I'll pronounce that correctly someday. Um, so idyllic. Uh, everything is exactly where it's supposed to be. There's no pain, there's no uh, tears, there's no death, and it is just covered with this shroud of innocence. Uh, they, they, were, they were, and if you didn't understand how much innocence was in the garden, uh, you did by the time you got to chapter 2, uh, chapter 2, Verses uh, 24 and 25, he says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And this is right after he created Eve, Adam and Eve, in the garden. And then he says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Shame is a powerful force. It's one that you and I are intimately familiar with. We, I'm, I'm not even sure if we know when the idea of shame started for us, but I know it starts at a very young age. You can watch kids as their body language starts to express shame as they feel ashamed about how they behaved or what they've done. I think typically it's a mom who teaches a kid to feel shame the first time. Um, shame is powerful, and it is a powerful Spiritual force. Um, dictionary defines shame as a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. For example, strapping an awning on top of the Prius, no shame at all. <laughs> foolish behavior, whatever. I can't believe how many of you said, did you get a ticket for that? I did not get a ticket for that. It was not foolish. But shame enters into the picture in Genesis. Just take a look at the first two times that people sinned and we see that shame enters in. Both uh, the first two cycles of sin and shame are pretty easy to track. Adam and Eve experienced shame after they broke the one rule that they had to keep. And so they were ashamed and they hid from God because they were naked and they knew it. And then we see the cycle of uh, sin and shame come with Cain and Abel. When Cain killed Abel because Abel's, Abel's sacrifice was better. And it's interesting to me that shame enters into the picture 
uh, when we begin to play the comparison game. But Adam and Eve played this game. The very first time they looked at the forbidden fruit and the serpent said, are we going to eat that? And she said, well, no, we, were, we can eat from anything, but we can't eat from that. Uh, that's forbidden. And the serpent said, well, that's because if you eat from this, you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And at that moment, Eve realized that there was something that was withheld from her that she could possibly have. So she took it and she ate. Handed it to her husband, who was right there with her. Cain and Abel fell into sin, and then the cycle of sin and shame. Uh, when Cain and Abel both offered a sacrifice, but Abel's sacrifice was pleasing to God and Cain's was not. And Cain's was, Cain was angry and he was frustrated. He was enraged. And this comparison between him and his brother led to the murder of his brother, Abel. Shame, may, maybe more than anything else. In my mind, uh, when, when we explore the idea of shame, I think shame is maybe the best indicator that we live in a fallen world. If you carry shame with you, that's a reminder that you and I live with a fallen nature, in a fallen world, as fallen people. Shame is a burden that we carry, not how God created it in the garden, but as a testimony to the fact that I am an imperfect person and cannot keep the righteous statutes of God. But I'm still captivated with that idea of the innocence of the garden. Not the way it is now, but the way that God intended for things to be. And, and I'm not alone. In fact, actually, in the Bible, over and over again, when we look at the fallen world, what we find is biblical authors push us forward to look either back to the garden or forward to the end of times. Isaiah says, uh, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Sins have a powerful effect on us as we carry them around. We carry around sin. We carry around guilt. We carry around shame. And there's always been a part of us all throughout history as we rebel against God that longs for the garden. We long for what Adam and Eve were given, but we were not born into. And so as we see these cycles of the rebellion of God's people, what we find our prophets stand up and say, it will not always be like this. It has not always been like this. It can be different. You do not need to carry the shame and the guilt and the sin that you carry because God is a God who forgives. My favorite is in Revelation where he says, things are going to end up pretty similar to how they started out. Uh, there's a lot to Revelation that describes it. A gar essentially, a garden at the end. There was a garden at the beginning. There were trees in the center of it. Um, it sure looks a lot like it started out. In Revelation 21.4, he says, uh, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall, no death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So it's not just a longing that I have for what has been, and I read in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and 3, but I have this deep hope inside of me that God can undo what we currently experience for something better in the future. When will that happen? The day, the day where we put down our guilt and our shame for who we are and our failings, when does that day happen? When shame chases us no more. Sadly, the answer is probably not in the church. Maybe the most worn out tool in the tool shed is the way the church reinforces shame among members who struggle with sin when God has set them free.
in the middle of a remodel on my house. Um, and in the process of doing some demolition, I've got like nine different uh, windows in the basement and managed to keep all of them intact except one. We broke one when we were doing some demolition in the very uh, basement. And so I was, in the, I was planning already on replacing some of the windows. There's an excellent... There's an excellent resource, by the way. You get a rebate from Puget Sound Energy if you, uh, if you replace an old single pane with a thermally insulated window. And so we broke uh, one of those old windows, and I thought, well, I'm going to try my hand at installing a window. I'll try one first if I do well with this. Well, even if I don't, I'm going to install all of them eventually. So we ordered a window, and I decided that I'm going to try to install it. And the problem that I have... Uh, it's a personal problem. I'm confessing something here. It means you have to be gentle with this, okay? So <laughs> treat me kindly. Um, the problem I have with installing a window is that I just don't actually have the time to install the window, <laughs> like you would think. And so it feels like my schedule for the last several weeks has been, um, well, I think I can do that, trying to carve out time in my day to do that task. Well, I think I can do that too, trying to carve out time in my day to do that task. I, I think I can do that too, carving out time in my day to do that one. And so I bounce around from one thing to another, never quite giving it enough time to bring it to completion, and then I need to move on to some, something else. I've got a handful of things at church that I'm working in, and then I have this obligation to, to be working in my house uh, on, on the things that are not going well in the basement. And so I started um, replacing the window. I'm still in queue replacing that window. I thought about taking a picture to share it with you because it's one sad thing. I, I took, took the window, removed it from the frame, and then I looked down at the wood and I thought, okay, let's see if... Uh, well, first, I, I peeled down the, the covering that I had that kept all the cold air out, realized that I had destroyed that in the process of taking it off, so I can't put it back on. So I have this big open window with uh, cold air blowing in all the time. But nobody's in the basement, so who cares? Um, and then when I removed the window to try to, uh, to figure out how to install the new window, I realized that I needed a little bit of trim work, didn't have time for that, so I'll do that later. I'll put the old window back in. Went and bought some trim, went, took out the window again, tried to install the new one only to find out that the window sill was rotted. But this is not just any window sill. This was custom constructed out of two by six cedar that has been uh, trimmed, uh, cut at an angle in a certain way for a drip plate. And so, I don't know anything about installing windows. I'm using big words, hoping to sound like I make sense. That's all I know. Just so you know. Somebody here is shaking their head going, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, so, so, how do I match that angle? Oh, I'll just cut a piece of this out. And so I cut a piece of this drip plate out, and then realized that I don't have enough time to go and custom uh, cut a new piece of cedar to put it back. And so right now, if you were to go visit my house, you would find that one of the windows is not ready for an intruder. It'd be very, very easy to get past because there's broken window, there's a window sill that's gone, and I think I've kind of just taped the window back into place because I haven't had time to finish the project. The, the, whole, the whole story of my life, my, my, all my home repairs, feels like it's the same story that's being repeated over and over and over again. I want to do this, and I want to take care of my basement, but I don't have the time to do that, so I'll, I'll get it at right now, and I'll, uh, then I'll wait, and then I'll, I'll work on it some more, and I'll wait. And the thing about a window is, once you start, there's no simple place to stop until you've finished. I feel like... Uh, the guy in the parable of the tower, uh, when, when Jesus says, which one of you uh, would build a tower without first counting the cost? It's not the money that's the cost. It's the time that's a cost. I clearly don't have enough time to take care of my house. Which seriously, in all seriousness, makes me feel guilty and ashamed as a father and a provider for my family. Because I have a mountain of work to do 
in my basement that I have not gotten, uh, I have not taken the time to do. We'll get there eventually. Um, but I carry a good amount of guilt about the fact that I am not taking care of my house. But if you look at it, because uh, it speaks to my core identity as a father and a provider for my kids, and I'm not asking for help. Trust me, I'm a control freak. I wouldn't trust you working on my house anyway. <laughs> this is a place for truth, right? <laughs> truth is, it's not just places like providing for my family that I carry guilt. Um, I am terribly anxious about who I am as a father. And God gave me these two little kids. They were, ti- they, were ti- they were tiny at one point in time. Now not so much. But I've broken a lot of things in my life. What happens if I break them? Dads can do it. I carry around guilt uh, for perhaps not being the right husband that I should be because I, my wife is a treasure and I do not tell her enough. Uh, but probably the one that, uh, that you don't realize is that I carry a tremendous amount of guilt and anxiety over serving as a preacher or minister. In fact, I read a statistic, I read a, a survey one time that said out of everybody who starts in ministry, less than one out of ten actually retire in ministry. Do you know that? Less than one out of ten. Probably squares with some of your experience. You've watched so many fall and by the wayside. About 30% of the people who are no longer in ministry when it's time to retire did so because they had a moral failure of one type or another. And so ministry was not open and eligible for them any longer. Uh, the other... Uh, out of 90%, sorry, the other, about 60% ended up leaving ministry because they felt ineffective and unsuited for ministry. They'll, they'll do the tasks of a preacher, but they don't feel like they're making any headway. They're treading ground. They'll preach and they'll preach and they'll preach. And not know if this is the message that the people of God need to hear. God, who do you want me to be? I don't know. And while it's easy to stand up and look really confident in front of a group of people, the truth is, I carry with me guilt and anxiety about who I am as a father, as a husband, as a provider for my family, and as a preacher for this church. Truth is, guilt chases us all. And it's absolutely not just me. In fact, you ladies have it worse than I do. I'm a a relatively self-confident person. But you have it a thousand times worse uh, than I do. I'm the tip of the iceberg. Ladies take it to a whole new level. And that's why why they write books like um, Mommy Guilt. Where mothers who work and work and work at being the perfect mom just cannot be enough of the perfect mom. And so they carry guilt with them no matter where they go. They can't work enough. They can't be with their kids enough. They can't provide nutritious enough meals. Can I? I'm going to say this and then I'm probably just going to run. Ladies, what you have to experience the catty behavior of how other women talk about women and size each other up and down is awful and ungodly. I know that I carry around some some guilt and stress and frustration for what I do, and I know I'm an obtuse person compared to what you go through every day. And and so the truth is... uh, The truth is, shame is this enormous force in our life, but it's a powerful spiritual force that seems to always cast a shadow over us no matter what we're doing, even if we're trying to be faithful to Jesus Christ. We carry this cloud of shame with us wherever we go. Growing up, there were uh, very few pivotal commercials that I I remember. I can only remember a couple. I remember Where's the Beef? Um, 
I remember um, two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. You guys enjoyed food too. Um, but there's one. It was about an eating disorder. Uh, it opens up and there's a woman and there's a chocolate cake. And it pans on the chocolate cake and it pans on the woman. And it goes back to the cake. Do you remember this? Did this air anywhere where you were at? Don't remember it? All right. And the narrator said, what you are seeing is a woman being consumed by cake. It sounds strange unless you're one of the, they listed a number of people who suffer from an eating disorder. I had to have been six when I first heard that commercial. It aired only for maybe six months, but it captivated my attention because how could a cake possibly eat somebody? Romans uh, chapter 6, uh, verses 13 and 14. Paul does something interesting here when he talks about sin. Uh, I want to I wanna see if you catch this because it only happens a few times in Scripture. He says in Romans chapter 6, um, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. See, what Paul does here in Romans chapter 6, he does it a little bit. He starts, he starts in chapter 5, towards the end of chapter 5, and he hits it in chapter 6. He, he does it again in chapter 7. He does it in chapter 8. As he uses this idea of sin, the only other place I've seen this in the Bible is one time. Well, I've seen it a couple times. I've seen it once in the Prophets and again once in uh, the Gospel of John. But Paul parks on this for chapters. Sin is typically something that you do. You go, you kick my puppy... You sinned, right? You haul a 17-foot awning with a Prius. You have not sinned. Sin is typically something that you do. But Paul changes it, and he turns the entire thing up on its head. Sin is now personified. Instead of sin something that it, sin being something that I have control over, what Paul says is sin has a spiritual activity. Sin is something that actually can exert control over you. You can be under the power of sin. Sin can, since it's not something that you do anymore, sin can now exist outside of you. Sin can exist over you. It can be your master. It can control you. You think you control sin, but you don't. What you find is that the cake consumes you instead. What we fail to realize sometimes is this is, this, is, this is Paul's argument for the state of all of humanity. You think you're in control of this sin thing, but you're not. This sin thing has control over you. Now, the moment we acknowledge that sin has this kind of power over our lives, we actually begin to make progress. Because that's the beginning of actually getting rid of guilt. Your behavior is no longer something that you're in control of. It's something that is in control of you. The, the reason, the reason uh, we get it wrong so often when we talk about sin and behavior modification is because we don't place control where it belongs. You're doing that, stop doing that. Really easy to say. Really hard to do. In Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. There is an early, early uh, church hymn that Paul quotes here. Chapter 1, starting with verse 15. And it's uh, the Christ hymn, as it's sometimes subtitled. 
We know, we're pretty sure it's a hymn uh, that it had um, a melody or at least a monotone that went with it. Uh, the church sang it when they gathered together most likely because we see meter in the way it was written out in the Greek. Uh, and it, it begins in verse 15 and it ends in verse 20 in Colossians chapter 1. This is what it says about Jesus Christ. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And by the way, Put your ears on. This is a densely packed passage. He moved from one idea that is deep to another idea that is deep to another idea that is deep until he has confessed everything there is to confess about the identity of Jesus Christ. Okay? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And it is before all things and in him all, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is in the beginning, the first from the dead, and in everything that might... Uh, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Okay. So what he confesses here, the Christ hymn, in Colossians chapter 1, is that Jesus was, uh, was there before the world was created. And when the world was created, it was actually created through him and through his power. Therefore, Jesus is the author of the creation that you and I see and experience, right? Remember this creation that we were talking about in Genesis chapter 1? Th this creation that we didn't keep together very well? Okay, so Jesus is the author of this creation, right? He holds it all together by his own power. That means the, the, the laws of gravity, the laws of uh, electromagnetism, all that stuff. That's actually Jesus behind the scenes. You're just, you're just seeing his handiwork. Um, Jesus holds it all together. And then Jesus goes into the activity of redeeming creation. Because the results of our sin and our rebellion is death. And so Jesus was born of a woman into this world so that he could be a part of the creation, so that he could triumph over the fallenness of creation and be the firstborn, so that he could be the firstborn uh, of the resurrection. He's the beginning, the firstborn of the resurrection, uh, uh, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Now, I want you to see that he's trying to make the point here in Colossians that Jesus is the key to undoing the curse of the world and of all of creation. Jesus actually came down in earth so that death could be conquered through flesh. And after reading this, after writing this incredible Christ hymn, what does Paul say about it? He says, and you... Who, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. What, what he's saying is, You and I, despite our best efforts, do not have any control over the sin thing. It has control over us. Just like Adam, just like Cain, just like every other man who has ever lived, we rebel against God and we're enslaved to our desires and our sin. The solution is another man who redeems us from all of these things. And he says, you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil things, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. In order to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach. He 
And yet, you and I still carry this enormous burden of sin. I think they've done it one time out at Delano. Um, I've seen it done a couple different times out at uh, Camp Yamhill. Gather a group of teenagers at the beginning of the week and you say, go take a sin, uh, go take a rock, write a sin on it that you've been struggling with, put it in your backpack, carry it around. At, at Yamhill, we were uh, very unkind to the teens. We didn't tell them that that backpack was going to be worn all week long. If you needed to take the backpack off, you could give it to somebody else and they could carry your burden for you. But you can't just lay it down. You need to carry it with you. What is it that you're struggling with? Some kids, before they realize what's going on, they'll, they'll pick these really big rocks. I think, I think in order to be really macho or, or, or maybe, maybe it's confessional and they're like, I'm really struggling with some stuff right now. Either way, it works great as an illustration because kids wear the backpack and after a while, on the first day, it's really uncomfortable. On the second day, they've invented ways to pad their shoulders because the straps are rubbing into their shoulders. On the third day, the nurse is really angry at the director of the camp. And at the end of the week, we bring kids to the foot of the cross and we say, why are you carrying this burden? And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This uh, he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them, uh, over them in him. In other words, all of those burdens that you're carrying, all of the guilt that the, the law says that you're guilty of, has been nailed to the cross. And, and we can read this and intellectually say, yeah, my, my sins have been nailed to the cross. But, but does it really count if you're still carrying them? Here's my advice to you. If you carry guilt and shame because of the struggle that you're experiencing, that's not necessarily a bad thing entirely, but Satan can use it as ammunition and it can be crippling for you. I know people who, who believe intellectually that all their sins were nailed to the cross, but they would never live that way because they're crippled by fear, shame, and guilt. And if you're one of those people or you know somebody who is, and since most statistics are made up on the spot, I'm going to say like 70% of us carry more shame and guilt than we ought to. My advice to you, stop it. Stop giving sin the power to define you. What an incredible power. And yet we let our sin and our failing define us. Stop giving sin the power to define you. Now this is important, especially if you've been raised in the context where love is conditional. And some of us are. Son, I would love you if you got better grades. Sweetheart, don't you think you need a little, little bit more makeup? It's as serious as life and death. death. I've, watched, I've watched parents wreck their kids because their love was completely conditional. And that's what we believe somehow. Uh, that's how we believe uh, God's love is. Uh, it's conditional. And so I want to challenge you to stop giving sin the power to define you. And not, not only should you believe that your sin is nailed to the cross, why don't you just hand over your guilt and your shame, your humiliation and your dishonor to Jesus to have him nail those to the cross too? Because the fact of the matter is, you don't have control over sin. Sin has control over you except for Jesus. Amen. 
But understanding the truth of what I just said will transform your faith. Instead of a faith of sorrow, guilt, and shame, it's a faith of joy. And if you're a skeptic and you don't believe me, I'll say it again. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. Want to hear it again? What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how can we not also with him graciously give us all things? Uh, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. You know that word justified? It's a, it's a church word that we use all the time. We have no idea what it means. I mean, we use it all the time and we have no idea what the word justified actually means. It means to make something righteous. If I work on an engine and I make it really efficient, I did something to make it this way, right? Um, how can somebody make me righteous? I, I, I would just assume that righteousness is something that I do. I either earn it or I earn death, right? I, I'm, I'm earning an A, a B, a C, a D in, in school. But he says here, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is God who makes us righteous. Now there's a rub there and there's something that you got to catch. It is not you who makes you righteous. It's not you who makes you righteous if you're a little more righteous than your neighbor. It's not you who makes you righteous if you're mostly righteous. It's God who makes you righteous because you can't be. How about rather than letting our sin define us, how about you let Jesus define you? You realize that this is, this is the power of the Gospels. This, these are the stories that we gravitate to all the time in the Gospels. Uh, uh, so uh, Luke records uh, the story of the, uh, the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And we always seem to gravitate towards that because we see the compassion of Jesus as he treats this woman who is a social pariah with care. And if treating that woman isn't enough, we flock to John chapter 8, where we see this woman who was caught in adultery, drugged before Jesus, and he treats her with care. All the children are brought to Jesus, and his disciples say, no, 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 leave him alone. The master is way too busy. And he says, no, 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 let the children come to me, for such belongs to the kingdom of God. In Luke... He's seated and this woman takes what is maybe her entire life savings and she lavishes it on Jesus' feet. And her apostles, his apostles are offended. They're offended on all sorts of levels. They're offended on the one level that she's a sinful woman and if he actually knew who she was, he wouldn't let her do that. They're offended on another level with righteous indignation. If, if she would just sell it, she could do some real good with that with that stuff. That's expensive perfume. And yet the gospel is filled with stories of people who approach Jesus without being worth the mercy and forgiveness and grace and love that they receive. I, I cannot even imagine what it is like to come face to face with Jesus carrying a backpack the size of a Mack truck and having him cut the straps off and say, that's not yours to carry anymore. It's nailed to the cross. You see, the truth of the matter is I am guilty of sin. I know what they are.
And despite my fight against sin, I don't always win. I frustrate myself because I don't win as much as I want. And like Paul says, it's Christ in me if I'm doing the right thing. It's sin inside of me if I'm not. I, I don't understand what I'm doing. I do the things that I do not want to do. I experience that in my life every day. But praise God that I am not defined by my sins and I'm not defined by my, my mistakes. I'm defined by Jesus Christ. And while it is important for the church to preach that God has a holy and righteous standard and nobody lives up to it because our world doesn't want to hear that, the good news is, despite your failing, Christ can make you blameless. Um, there is a, a song that we sing. I, I almost, I, I, I like the, uh, the song, In Christ Alone. I'd almost want us to sing it again uh, because it's powerful. Uh, we, we try to make our faith about ourselves and about our doing and about what we've accomplished, and it's not at all about us. It's not even, not even an ounce about me. There's a song that, uh, that we don't sing, but I hear it every once in a while. Usually stream it on YouTube. It goes like this. In the morning when I rise. In the morning when I rise. In the morning when I rise. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, give me Jesus. There are four stanzas. It finishes with, and when I go to die, and when I go to die, when I go to die, give me Jesus. You can have all of this world. Give me Jesus. And we make faith and holiness and righteousness more convoluted than it needs to be because it's not my work. It begins and it ends with Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of my faith. My sins have been nailed to the cross. Am I a holy and righteous person? No, but by the grace of God, I'm blameless Amen. anyway. And I want you to know that Jesus will not turn you away. I don't care what load of guilt you are carrying about your insufficiencies. Jesus will not turn you away. There's more to say on this about who he expects us to be. But he loves you. He receives you. He cares about you. He washes you. He redeems you. And he makes you blameless before God. Because it's not something you could do. Only Jesus could. If you need to respond to the invitation, it is wide open. Because he's prepared to wash you and cleanse you. If you need to respond, if you need the prayers of the church, if you've never done it, you need to put on Christ in baptism. If you need to respond for any reason, let us know how we can help you by coming forward as we stand and sing.